Hey Optimancers, Chris here. So last week I discussed tanking in D&D and I talked about classes that work well with tanking, ones that don't work so well with tanking, and I talked about the feats you might want to consider with tanking and the considerations you want to make when you are going to make a tank character. Specifically that you don't just need to worry about your own defense, you also need to worry about the defense of the other members of your party. I've come up with a build I'm pretty proud of that I think would be very effective in the tanking role and that is what I'm going to be presenting for you today. But before we get to that, first I want to thank some of my patrons. These are Archmage level patrons who help me build and grow this channel. And I want to thank them so much for their support and specifically today I want to thank Bob Raymond, Dash Panther, Yunru, T-U-M, Michael Troy, Christian Windham, Awesome Face, and Leighton Hagland. Thank you so much for your support, and let's get started with my tank build for today. So for a while on this channel, I've wanted to build a Barbarian character. Uh, I haven't really done that, and I think a Barbarian, although I don't think it's one of the more powerful classes in the game, I think it still can be made into an effective character. And when I'm thinking about tank characters, one of the things that is really attractive about the Barbarian is, of course, their ability to take damage. Uh, first off, they have more hit points than any other class in the game, but they kind of multiply those hit points because when they are raging, they have resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage. And the Barbarian subclass I see played by far the most, uh, and I don't think this is just my experience, I suspect this is universal, is that the Totem Warrior Barbarian seems to get a ton of play. And there's good reason for that. The Totem Warrior subclass is really good. And we can do things like get resistance to all kinds of damage except for Psychic. Or provide advantage to all our party members on their attack rolls. Lots of really nice abilities that come with the Totem Warrior right when you take it at level 3. And so I see just a ton of Totem Warriors being played. So Totem Warrior is definitely not the subclass I want to make a Barbarian for. The other Barbarian subclass I see played a fair amount is the Zealot, because the Zealot is the Barbarian subclass that is probably the best at delivering damage without suffering the debilitating effects that come with playing Path of the Berserker. Now the Zealot is, as I said, good at delivering damage, but they're not really made for taking a lot of damage. Uh, in fact, the Zealot is kind of built into the subclass abilities that they're probably going to die, and they're resurrected more easily. And although I like this conceptually, it's definitely not what I'm going for today. Now, one of the subclasses for Barbarian that I really like, but I don't see played very often, or even talked about as often as I think it should be, is the Path of the Ancestral Guardian. Now, I think part of the reason for this is because the Path of the Ancestral Guardian isn't really built on doing more damage, and people like the idea of doing more damage. It also isn't really built for protecting itself more, like the Totem Warrior Barbarians are, and I think that turns people off it as well. But what the Ancestral Guardian is excellent at is protecting the rest of the party, and I do think that is your primary goal when you are playing a tank. And I've wanted to make a path of the Ancestral Guardian Barbarian for some time now, and I've actually got a couple different builds that I've done for the Ancestral Guardian that I like, but the build I'm going to present today is the one I think is the best at tanking. So when we look at the path of the Ancestral Guardian, there's a couple abilities that really shout out tanking. The first is coming in right at third level, and that's the Ancestral Protectors. When you choose this path at third level, Spectral Warriors appear when you enter your rage. While you're raging, the first creature you hit with an attack on your turn becomes the target of the warriors, which hinder its attacks. Until the start of your next turn, the target has disadvantage on any attack roll that isn't against you. And when the target hits a creature other than you with an attack, that creature has resistance to the damage dealt by the attack. The effect on the target ends early if your rage ends. There's a lot of things I just love about this ability. 
The first is there is no saving throw. So as soon as you hit a creature with an attack when you're in rage, this is up. And if you hit the biggest, toughest, most deadly enemy that there is in a combat, you are really restricting that enemy to attack you. Because if it attacks anybody else, it doesn't just have disadvantage on the attack roll. But even if it hits, they're going to have resistance to the type of damage it does. And it doesn't matter the type of damage it does. With our rage, we're of course restricted to piercing, bludgeoning, and slashing damage. But this will actually affect any kind of damage. So if a creature does necrotic damage with a hit, like a lot of undead do, there's going to be resistance to the kind of damage it does. And that is, again, a really nice ability. Now the limitation here is that it only lasts a turn. So you basically have to hit that enemy every turn in order to keep this up. So if you miss your attack, then this isn't going to hold anymore. And if we want to protect the rest of our party, then hitting with our attacks is pretty important. Now the best way to do this with a barbarian is using reckless attack. The issue with using reckless attack is, of course, it hurts our own defense. And ancestral protectors isn't helping our own defense either. So we are really encouraging that creature to attack us. So I think if you want to make the best use of ancestral protectors, you need to cause barriers on that creature's ability to attack you. Otherwise, you might have a tough time staying up. The next ability I think that is really strong for tanking for a Path of the Ancestral Guardian Barbarian is Spirit Shield, and this comes in at 6th level. And what this does is if we see a creature other than us that takes damage while we're raging, we can use our reaction to reduce the damage by 2d6. This does scale with level, but it starts at 2d6 at 6th level. I also really like this ability. Uh, the first thing is, of course, is if we are protecting our allies with Ancestral Protectors, and then they get hit anyways, they're going to have resistance to the damage, so that damage is halved. But in addition to that, we can also reduce the damage by 2d6. The other thing I really like is that I think reducing damage is just straight up better than healing damage. And there's a couple reasons for that. The first is, of course, if a creature's close to going down, reducing damage might prevent them from going down, while healing, they will go down and then you bring them back up, which isn't as good as them not going down in the first place. And the second thing is, if we have an ally that's concentrating, then that reduction to damage is really helpful because we will either reduce the DC of that concentration save or potentially even eliminate it. Now the 10th level feature gives you the ability to cast Augury and Clairvoyance. I think both these are okay spells and it's not a bad ability, but it's not really based on tanking effectively. And then the 14th level feature, what it does is it kind of improves our spirit shield so that the creature that's delivering the attack takes some damage. So it's an okay ability for increasing our damage potential. But again, we're not really improving our tanking ability. It's not about defending the party member as much as delivering more damage. So when it comes to tanking, I think this really brings a lot at level 3 and level 6. But I don't see a lot of reason to go past level 6 in terms of being an effective tank. Now if we look at the Barbarian base class, the first level ability of Rage is a great tanking ability because what it will do is give us that resistance to the bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage, which is probably the most common kinds of damage you take when you're fighting. At level 2, we're going to get Danger Sense. This is going to improve our Dexterity saving throws against effects we can see. In most cases, when you make a Dexterity saving throw, this is going to apply. I also like the seventh level feature for Barbarians, Feral Instinct. This is going to give us advantage on initiative rolls, and initiative is actually pretty important for a Barbarian. If you get attacked before your initiative comes up in a combat, you are not going to have a chance to rage before that damage takes effect, so you aren't going to have resistance to the damage. Also, if we want to make use of our subclass feature, it's really helpful to be able to attack before the enemy gets their first action. But once we get beyond level 7, the Barbarian's not offering nearly as much for tanking. We're already up to 4 rages per day, and it doesn't go to 5 until we get to level 12. And as we move up in Barbarian, more and more of the class features are about improving our critical hits. And this character isn't going to really be focused on delivering critical hit damage. 
Uh, and we can absolutely make an effective Barbarian that does focus on critical hit damage, but that just isn't the focus of this particular build. So I do think that 7th level is really all I want in Barbarian levels. Now I want to talk a little bit about Rage. Uh, there's one thing about Rage that we need to consider if we are going to multi-class, and that is if you are able to cast spells, you can't cast them or concentrate on them while raging. So if we multi-class into a spellcaster, this really limits what we can do. However, it doesn't actually prevent all spellcasting. It means you can't cast spells while you're in rage or concentrate on spells when you're in rage. That doesn't mean that you can't benefit from spells while you're in rage. There are spells that don't require concentration that you could set up before combat begins and they could still help you even after you start a rage. It also doesn't prevent you from initiating any magical effects. It's limited to casting spells. So if we get subclass features that have magical effects that aren't casting spells, we can still do them while we're in rage. So this is the primary part of the rage feature that I want to take into account as I'm considering multi-classing. Now my initial thought was I wanted to create an ancestral barbarian that used no armor except for a shield and a sword. It just matches some of the artwork I've seen for barbarians that I really like. And I thought that could work quite well with an Ancestral Guardian Barbarian. Because, again, we can really expect the creatures to be attacking us and not our allies because we are making it so hard for them to attack our allies. And the idea of having a barbarian that focuses on dexterity and constitution and wears a shield. And remember, a barbarian can wear a shield and still benefit from unarmored defense. This means that a barbarian can actually build a really strong armor class using a shield and no armor. And that was my initial intent for this build. But ultimately, I thought, as a tank, I want to at least be able to deliver effective damage as well as that. And when I looked at that build versus my baseline, and if you don't know what my baseline is, it's basically just an arbitrary number I use to determine whether I figure the damage is strong or weak. And ultimately, if I'm going to make a character that being able to deliver damage needs to be part of what it does, I want to be able to beat that baseline at all levels. And that required me to make a few decisions on this character that I didn't initially intend to do, because I needed to make some adjustments to make sure it could deliver over baseline damage. Especially at level 11, I found that in order to meet the baseline, I had to make some offensive decisions instead of defensive ones. So this character is going to be delivering over the baseline damage at level 1, at level 20, and every level in between. Specifically, the damage is actually quite strong between levels 5 and 10, and at other levels, the damage is still effective damage, but not as much as we could make if we were really focusing on our offense entirely. So as a tank, this is about where I would expect it to be if we are an effective tank, because a tank's primary role is defensive. But Generally speaking, I like a tank to be able to deliver damage as well, and this build will be able to do that effectively at all levels. So this build I call the Guardian, and you will need to have access to critical role content in order to make this build work. Specifically, you're going to need to have access to Explorer's Guide to Wildmount. This is official content. However, it is also campaign dependent. So your DM may determine that critical role content is not available for your campaign. And it, if that's the case, this is not the build for you. Now, initially I had the race for this character, a halfling. I love halflings and the idea of making an effective halfling ancestral guardian barbarian, I thought was fantastic. And I do think defensively, halfling brings so much to the table with Lucky, with Brave, and with the resistance to poison gained by the stout subrace. But offensively, I just couldn't meet the numbers with the Halfling. So in order to make this effective, I had to change it to the Variant Human. Of course, the advantages to the Variant Human is I can place my ability score bonuses exactly where I need them, and I access a feat right at first level. So my racial decisions at first level, we get a bonus language, I chose Giant, it could be anything you want. The ability score increases, easy to pick. Strength and Constitution. 
The skill I'm going to pick is history. Now, I often pick perception with a variant human, but I'm going to have access to the perception skill through Barbarian. And I'm actually going to be a decently intelligent character. So history is something that I might be able to make use of. And then the feat. And the feat I'm going to choose is Resilient Wisdom. This is a feat I really like to have on any Barbarian. My biggest problem with the Barbarian class, as it is mechanically presented in D&D, is that they have no way to avoid fear effects. And there is nothing more humiliating than playing a Barbarian raged, and suddenly you get hit with a frightened effect, and now you get to play a scared and timid Barbarian. So something I always want to do when I'm looking at a Barbarian build is figure out how I'm going to get my Wisdom save to a decent number. Now I should note there is one subclass that can deal with Charmed and Fear, and that is the Berserker Barbarian. At level 6 they actually have immunity to both of those, and that ability I actually really like. Unfortunately, I'm not a big fan of the third level ability for the Berserker Barbarian, so I tend not to play Berserker Barbarians, but I just wanted to mention that is one way to get around the problem with Charm and Fear with a Barbarian. So I've used a point by for my ability scores, and what I've done is first off, 15 in strength is going to give me a total of 16. This is as good as we're going to get at first level, and it's going to make this character more likely to hit and do more damage. The second one, 14 dexterity. Now, some barbarian builds are going to have a 16 dexterity because they're going to focus on unarmored defense. I gave up on armored defense with this build. I figure we can wear medium armor as a barbarian, and that's what we're going to do. And if you're going to wear medium armor, the dexterity score you want is 14. And then I put a 13 in Constitution, that's going to give me a total of 14 Constitution. That is less, again, than some barbarians will see, because, again, if you're using Unarmored Defense, Constitution is part of that. Again, we're not going to be using Unarmored Defense. We're going to be wearing armor, so that's not a problem. We're already going to have good hit points. We are going to have good Constitution saving throw. So losing that one modifier to Constitution and that one hit point per level I don't think is a deal breaker. Now what we're going to do unusual here is we're going to have a 13 intelligence because this character is going to multiclass into wizard. Now I get that wizard is a weird mix with barbarian but I do think we can get a lot from it and I will go over that when we get there. And then finally with the last point I'm going to bump up my wisdom to 9 because with the resilient feat that becomes a 10. So I'm no longer going to have a penalty to my wisdom. And in fact, because of the feat, I'm going to have a bonus to my wisdom saving throws that will scale with level. I'm going to take my first level in Barbarian. This is going to give me the best hit points at first level. And the proficiencies I'm going to choose are Athletics and Perception. I think both of these are really great skills for a Barbarian. Athletics, of course, can prevent you from being grappled. Or if I want to grapple somebody, I could do so using the Athletics skill. And Perception, of course, is such a useful skill. It comes up in the game all the time. I'm going to be able to rage twice per day. When I do so, I'm going to get a plus two to my damage. And I'm going to get those nice resistances. Now we need to talk a little bit about the limitations on Rage, uh, because that is a limitation on this character, and I just want to be upfront about that. With the limitation of two Rages per day, that means that in a lot of campaigns we're not going to be Raging every combat, and this character will never have more than four Rages per day. We'll get there at level 6, and then from levels 7 through 20, our Rages don't increase at all. And we're not getting these back on a short rest, we're only getting them back on a long rest. So, depending on your campaign, even when we have four, I wouldn't necessarily expect that we can rage every battle. And because our tanking abilities largely rely on us being able to rage, it is going to prevent us from using those abilities in some of the combat. So, it's just something we're going to have to deal with. And the best way to do it is, often on the tone of the campaign, you have some kind of idea how many combats you're going to be facing. Uh, so if you are going to be facing less combats than you have rages, there's no issue. But if there are going to be more combats than you have rages or you expect there will be, then what you need to do is you need to gauge the combats. And if it is not one of the more challenging combats for the day, probably not the time to rage. Now you have a lot of options in terms of your background. Uh, personally, I took Noble. It's going to give me a few more gold I can spend at first level. And so with that, I'm going to get the Persuasion skill, and I'm going to choose the Acrobatic skill as well. So for my starting equipment, 
the weapon I'm going to choose is the Greatsword. The Greatsword delivers the most damage at this point. If we are making a Barbarian that's going to be focusing on criticals, at some point you probably want to switch over to a D12 weapon. And if we are talking about a Barbarian with a Polar Master Feat, then we would probably want to select something like the Halberd or the Glaive. Uh, but we don't have the Polar Master Feat, and Greatsword is going to deliver enough damage for us. So that is my selection at first level. Then we'll take the two hand axes, the explorer's pack, and the four javelins. So we will have some throwing options if we are in a situation where we need to attack at range. Now that purse containing 25 gold pieces is going to be the start of us working towards our scale mail armor. And at some point we're probably going to want to get half plate on this character. Because without armor, this character has an armor class of 14, which is not a good starting armor class. And I will be continuing with Barbarian for six levels. I will be coming back to Barbarian later, but the first six levels of this character, I am going to be going straight Barbarian. This is going to get us into our tanking features as soon as possible. With six levels of Barbarian, we get to four rages per day. That's twice as many as you can do with a one or two level dip in Barbarian. It will also give us both the Ancestral Guardian features that I was looking for. This character will be using Reckless Attack with their attacks. That means that attacks against us are going to have advantage because we are using our Reckless Attack. So we're going to get hit a lot. We do have good hit points and with Rage we can take more damage. So this will function very much like a standard Barbarian, taking a lot of damage, relying on heavy hit points, and delivering a hard hit. And Danger Sense is going to give us advantage on Dexterity Saving Throws, which is good. We only have a plus two bonus on Dexterity Saving Throws, but when you throw advantage on that, it does mean we're going to make a lot more Dexterity Saving Throws. And we're going to choose Ancestral Guardian as our subclass that's going to give us the two features that I've already talked about. The ability score improvement I'm going to choose at 4th level is a feat, and that will be the Lucky feat. I talked about this in my video last week about why Lucky is good for a tanking character. This character is going to have okay saving throws. We of course have proficiency in both Constitution and Wisdom saving throws, and we have advantage on Dexterity saving throws, and at least we have an ability score bonus on Dexterity. So we will be making a lot of saving throws to begin with. But we won't always be making our saving throws, and that's where Lucky comes in. And I think I should also mention that fast movement does not rely on you wearing no armor, like it does with, say, a monk. It only requires that we aren't wearing heavy armor, which we're not proficient in and we're not going to be wearing anyways. Again, we want to eventually get half plate for this character. So at 6th level, we're going to have 59 hit points. That's a good number of hit points. We're going to have an armor class of 17. That's an okay armor class. But it's not an amazing armor class, and especially if we're using Reckless Attack, we should still expect to be hit fairly often. So it's a good thing we have good hit points, and it's a good thing that we have Rage. And when we look at our important saving throws, Constitution is at plus 5, Wisdom is at plus 3, and Dexterity is at plus 2, and we are going to have advantage on most of those Dexterity saving throws. So decent saving throws. Not amazing saving throws, but probably better than average. At 6th level, we'll be delivering good damage versus the baseline. This is a hard hitter at this level. And with our subclass features, we will also be protecting the party. So our strategy when we are in combat is to rage on round 1 and attack the biggest, baddest enemy we can find. That enemy will be compelled to attack us and not the rest of the party. And if they do attack the rest of the party, they will have disadvantage and they will have resistance to that damage. In addition, this character is going to be able to reduce damage that other characters take. We're not using our reaction for anything else. That's what we want to use it on. So that can end up being a lot of damage mitigated through that ability when we're using it every round because this is not an ability that's limited in number of uses. We can use it once per round every round. That's seven damage mitigated every single round. And if we are facing multiple enemies, remember we're only locking down probably the biggest, baddest enemy. And that means that other party members are still going to take attacks and they're still going to take damage. But we can mitigate some of that damage as well as preventing the big, bad enemy from attacking our allies. So in terms of tanking, we're fulfilling everything we need to. 
Our defense is largely built on high hit points and resistance to damage. Our offense is taken care of. Our saving throws are pretty good and we are protecting other party members, not just against the biggest, baddest guy in the combat, which we are doing extremely effectively, but also against other enemies as well through mitigation of damage. So we are covering a lot of bases here, but I think we can do even better with a multi-class. So for the next four levels, I am going to multi-class into fighter. Uh, and I'm going to be taking four levels because I also want that ability score increase in addition to the subclass abilities that we're going to be getting. Now the fighting style I'm going to be selecting is great weapon fighting. With a great sword, great weapon fighting is going to increase our average damage a little over one per attack. It's basically one and a third extra points of damage per attack. Now the great weapon fighting style I don't consider the best fighting style. The reason I'm taking it here is it is necessary in order to achieve the baseline damage. If you don't care about delivering damage, take the defensive fighting style. I care about delivering damage with this character, so I'm going to be taking great weapon fighting, and I'm going to be addressing my defense in a different way. One way that we are actually improving our defense is with Second Wind. Now, Second Wind uses our bonus action because we're not a Polar Master or a Berserker Barbarian. We're not using our bonus action every round. So this is a good way for us to just improve some of those hit points. And keep in mind as well, if we are having resistance to the attacks because they're bludgeoning, piercing, or slashing, when we are getting any kind of healing, it's essentially doubled. Because although I'm healing 1d10 plus 4 hit points, because I have taken half damage from a lot of those attacks, that essentially ends up being twice as good as if I was taking full damage from those attacks. The other thing I'm going to be getting is Action Surge, which I will absolutely be using on every short rest. Now, when you really want to use Action Surge is when you miss. So if I'm attacking a creature, I'm attacking with advantage, I'm getting multiple attacks every turn, I'm usually going to hit but there's always the chance of a miss. Now I could use one of my lucky uses in order to get another chance for a hit, but I think Action Surge is a much better reaction to that situation because Action Surge is something I want to use anyways. It's just that's when I want to use it. Now when I'm talking about working out my DPR, my assumption is that we're fighting eight combats per day and four combats per short rest. And I assume that each of those combats is gonna have about four rounds. So that's the calculations I used for my action search. Basically, it's about a 16th of what I would be doing with a normal turn of attacking when I calculate DPR. But of course, those are my standards. And if we consider that we're only fighting one combat per day, maybe it only is three rounds, then of course, action search gives you much more. But the archetype is really defining what I'm going to be doing with this character. And I'm going to be taking the Echo Knight for this character as my multi-class. And taking Echo Knight is actually the main reason why I'm not going with Polar Master with this character. I know exactly how I want to work my defense with this character, and it is with the Echo Knight. Now, one thing we'll be getting is Unleash Incarnation. So what this does is basically a number of times equal to our Constitution modifier, we can make an additional attack when we take the attack action. Once again, like with Action Surge, this can help us in the case where we might miss an enemy. We always want to hit the enemy at least once to maintain our subclass feature from Ancestral Guardian Barbarian. So Unleash Incarnation is another insurance policy to make sure we get that hit. And also, this is technically increasing our DPR as well. Less than an Action Surge because it's only one attack and it only recharges on long rests but I use the same assumptions that I did with Action Surge when determining its effect on DPR. Manifest Echo. This is the reason I am selecting this subclass though. I think when we combine this with Ancestral Guardian Barbarian, this is insane. So Manifest Echo, what it does is you use your bonus action to magically manifest an echo of yourself in an unoccupied space you can see within 15 feet of you. Now, the only thing we really are doing with our bonus action is once in a while, we're going to use second wind. So most of the time, our bonus action is perfectly available. Now, you can do manifest echo as often as you want. You could use it with every bonus action if you wanted to. And it allows us to do a number of things. The first is, as a bonus action, we can teleport magically, swapping places with our echo, and it costs 15 feet of our movement. 
The last thing we can do is when a creature that we can see within five feet of our echo moves at least five feet away from it, we can use our reaction to make an opportunity attack against a creature as if we were in the echo space. But the main thing I want here is when you take the attack action on your turn, any attack you make with that action can originate from your space or the echo space. You make the choice for each attack. So why is this so good with the Ancestral Guardian Barbarian? Let me show you on a battle map. So what we have here is a theoretical battle map. And on the right side, I've just got a generic big baddie. Uh, and then on the left side is our party. And we will see our top two tokens are the same because we're always going to have that echo up. And we're going to make sure that our echo is set up before combat begins. This is not a problem because we have unlimited use of it and it doesn't have a duration. So anytime a combat is over, if you've lost your echo, you just make a new one. And what we want to do on round one of the combat is we want to rage. Then we want to move ourselves behind the rest of the party. Then we want to move our echo up to the enemy. Now that echo can move up to 30 feet, not requiring any action or bonus action by you. And as long as it stays within 30 feet of you, you're fine. Then we are going to make the attack action against the enemy using our echo. We're going to use Reckless Attack and everything to just make sure we get that hit on that enemy. Once we do that, we have marked them with our Ancestral Protection feature from our Ancestral Guardian Barbarian subclass. And finally, we're going to use our movement to move 30 feet away from the Echo. So now this big baddie is going to have disadvantage to attack any other party member, and regardless of any of the other party members it attacks, even if it overcomes that disadvantage, they'll have resistance to the damage it inflicts. So it really is compelled to attack us. This big bad enemy is in a lot of trouble because if they want to attack us, that's going to be really hard for them. They're going to have to move around all our allies and around our echo. And they're still going to have to be able to get in range to attack us. That is not necessarily going to be easy to do. So we end up in a situation where this creature can't really attack us effectively and can't attack our party members effectively anymore. So we have taken care of our own defense and we are still protecting the rest of the party. And round after round we're going to continue this strategy. Now this enemy could destroy the Echo. Echo is easy to destroy, but not as easy to destroy as an Echo normally is. An Echo has an AC of 14 plus your proficiency modifier. In this case it'll be 18 and the creature is going to have disadvantage to attack our Echo. The Echo doesn't suffer the penalty to defense that comes with our reckless attack because it is treated as a different target. And because it is a different target, the marked creature is going to have disadvantage to attack our Echo. So there's a good chance that that creature is not going to be able to hit our Echo. But we can set up a new Echo, no problem, using our bonus action that we're not using for anything else. Once we have initiated our rage on round one, our bonus action is available. The only other thing we could ever use a bonus action on is our second wind, which we might do if the creature attacks us instead of our echo. So we're using the tactics of the battlefield in order to shore up our own protection, which I think is important for this character because our armor class is okay and we're using reckless attack. So that means that it's not that hard for enemies to hit us. Now we can take a fair bit of damage, but using this tactic, we can potentially avoid that damage in the first place. So this is a bit of a counterintuitive kind of tanking because normally when you tank, you are in front of the rest of the party. In this case, we're actually behind the rest of the party. This is not your standard rah, rage barbarian. This is our tactical barbarian who's using thought in combat. And we're delivering decent damage and we are not just tough ourselves, but we've made every party member tough. And the last thing is at fourth level, I'm going to take that ability score improvement and I'm going to improve my strength score. Now I could take the greater weapon mastery feat. There's a couple issues I have with the greater weapon mastery feat for this character, though I am going to take it eventually, but there's a good reason why I want strength first. And what it is, is that basically when it comes to my damage per round, my calculations based on the assumptions I make and my calculations for DPR show strength delivering more damage than greater weapon mastery on average. The second thing is, the second feature of greater weapon mastery is the ability to immediately make an additional attack using our bonus action, 
But based on our positioning in a lot of combats, we will be unable to take advantage of that. So strength is going to deliver what we need to maintain over that baseline damage and deliver right now. So the next four levels we're going to take for this build will be with Wizard. Again, this is a weird combination with Barbarian, but I do think it works in this case. And the reason I want to take Wizard is so I can take the War Mage subclass. This is something I'm going to be able to take at second level of Wizard. And with the War Mage subclass, I'm going to gain two things. Number one, I'm going to get Tactical Wit. It's going to give me a plus one to my initiative, which is fine. Uh, but the main reason I want it is for Arcane Deflection. At second level, we've learned to weave our magic and fortify ourselves against harm. When you are hit by an attack or you fail a saving throw, you can use your reaction to gain a plus two bonus to your armor class against that attack or a plus four bonus to that saving throw. When you use this feature, you can't cast spells other than cantrips until the end of your next turn. So the last sentence there doesn't bother me one bit because most of the time when I use this, I will be in rage. So I can't cast spells anyways, but I can use Arcane Deflection because it's not a spell and it's not requiring my concentration. Plus two bonus to my armor class when I need it for a reaction, I'll definitely take that. But the plus four bonus to a saving throw when I need it using my reaction is massive. Once again, I have pretty good saves and I do have lucky, so I'm going to be making most saves. But Arcane Deflection is going to make it so I can make all the saves I need to. So I'm going to make a saving throw and if I make it, great. And if I don't make it, if Arcane Deflection is going to make up the difference, I will use it. If Arcane Deflection is not going to make up the difference, that's when I use Lucky to get the reroll. And if the reroll makes it, great. And if the reroll doesn't make it, then once again we have the option of adding our Arcane Deflection for another plus four. So we have just layers and layers of ways to make sure that we're making our saving throws. So we have done a lot of things here. Number one, of course we have good hit points and we can take a lot of damage. But number two, tactically we've made it difficult for enemies to attack us in the first place even though we're still protecting the rest of the party. And number three, we're making it hard for them to affect us even with spells. If we're facing off something like a dragon, for example, we will be making a saving throw versus fear because of the fear aura. We will be probably making saving throws versus the breath weapon. Arcane Deflection is going to help us in all those cases. And for our ability score improvement, we're going to increase our strength again for the exact same reason we did last time. Now with our spells, we just want to remember what kind of character we're playing here. The Booming Blade spell I still think is a good selection for this character. Remember, we're not going to be in Rage all the time. And if we're not in Rage, then we can actually use Booming Blade effectively with an Echo Knight. And the way we do that is we will make an attack using the Booming Blade ourselves. And then what we do is we're going to then switch places with our Echo. And now the creature is beside our Echo and if they want to move away to attack us or anybody else then they're going to trigger the secondary effect of Booming Blade and take that extra damage. Second spell I'm going to take is Light. Uh, again, I'm playing a human character. I don't have Dark Vision. Light is always good to have in that case. And again, it doesn't require concentration. And finally, I'm going to take Minor Illusion. And Minor Illusion I think is just a reasonably useful cantrip. Not something, again, I can use while I'm raged, but this is something that can come into effect often in those out of combat experiences. I also like Prestidigitation for this character. I think it's just a fun cantrip to have. I'm going to be selecting eight first level spells. By and large, I want rituals here. Rituals are utility. They tend to be used outside of combat when you're not raging anyway. They don't use up any spell slots and they don't require preparation. So alarm, comprehend languages, detect magic, find familiar, and Unseen Servant, I think they're all great selections here. That leaves us with three selections of non-ritual spells, and the ones I want to take are number one, Absorb Elements. If I haven't raged yet, and that dragon swoops over and hits us with a breath weapon, I'm going to be very glad I have the Absorb Element spell. Second I want is False Life. False Life is going to give temporary hit points. That is just another way for me to get additional hit points, and when I'm raged, those false life hit points are going to be lost at half the rate, just like my regular hit points, whenever I take slashing, piercing, or bludgeoning damage. The last one I'm going to take is Long Strider. Long Strider does not require concentration. It has a good duration. That means that we can often cast Long Strider outside of combat, 
and we can rage in combat and we're still going to benefit from it. Now we already have improved movement through Barbarian, but Long Strider will improve it even more. Then we're going to make four second level selections. Now partially I want to look at things I can do outside of combat, because that's when I'm not raging. So spells like Dark Vision make a lot of sense, as do spells like Knock. But I also want spells that I can potentially use in combat, and the one that I can probably use in combat is Mirror Image. Now Mirror Image does not require concentration, so this is again a spell I could potentially cast before a combat and then Rage and get the advantage of Mirror Image and Rage. And here's what I love about Mirror Image on a Rage, is when I use Reckless Attack, creatures are going to have advantage on attack rolls against me. That means they're very likely going to hit, but the Mirror Image doesn't care. Anytime a creature makes an attack, that's when our Mirror Image comes into play, and it does make a difference whether they have advantage or disadvantage or what have you. And we've made it harder for enemies to attack us, but we're still going to be attacked sometimes, and when we are, that's when those Mirror Images are going to be incredibly useful. Now the difficulty of using mirror image here is it only has a duration of a minute, so this is going to be something that we have to set up in a combat that we are able to prepare for. I do not want to spend my first round of combat casting mirror image when I could be laying down ancestral protectors. Final spell I'm going to take is flaming sphere. Now flaming sphere I absolutely cannot use when I am raged. But sometimes I'm not going to be raged. If we have a long adventuring day, I may not be able to rage for every combat. Flaming Sphere gives me something I can do to keep my damage output up. It also gives me something I can do with my bonus action when I'm using my Manifest Echo. So I can have my Manifest Echo up against an enemy and have my Flaming Sphere up next to an enemy. I can still maintain my position behind and get all my attack actions as well as benefit from additional damage through the Flaming Sphere using my bonus action. Now I can prepare five spells at this level. I'm going to prepare Absorb Elements, False Life, Long Strider, Flaming Sphere, and Mirror Image. Most of these spells I have the ability to cast before combat begins and benefit from them while I am in Rage. The exceptions are Absorb Elements and Flaming Sphere, and those will be handy to have for the times when I'm not in Rage. So that is a 14th level character. Again, we are doing above the baseline damage, and we have good saving throws now. Really good saving throws. We can use Arcane Deflection to up our armor class as well when we need to. But mainly our defense is built on our positioning and tactics in combat using our Manifest Echo. And we are protecting the rest of the party using our Path of the Ancestral Guardian Barbarian features. So we're going to go back to Barbarian for three more levels. And now we are going to take Great Weapon Master. This helps improve our damage yet again. But we are also going to get Feral Instinct, which is going to give us advantage on initiative rolls. And we have both our Dexterity and our Intelligence bonus to that initiative score. Now the Brutal Critical feature at level 9 doesn't add very much to our damage per round. But another thing that comes in at level 9 on Barbarian is our Rage bonus damage goes from plus 2 to plus 3. And that's why we're going for that ninth level of Barbarian. It helps us maintain above the baseline for damage. And by the time we get to level 17, we're now just straight out above the baseline right to level 20. So we can do whatever we want with our last three levels. And that's why I'm going to put them in Wizard. Because there are some other neat things we can do with more levels of Wizard. We get Power Surge through War Mage at level 6. And honestly, this isn't a great ability, so I'm not going to worry about going over it here. But there are some neat spells we can take for our 3rd and 4th level slots. We have some good Ritual spells at 3rd level. One of them is Water Breathing, lasts for 24 hours for you and the entire party. Again, this is something we're going to be doing outside of combat, so no problem with it conflicting with Rage. Lehman's Tiny Hut is one of my favorite ritual spells in the game. I'm going to take Counter Spell here as well. Again, I can't use it when I'm in Rage, but again, I'm not always winning initiative. And if a Spellcaster wins initiative and casts a spell, it's going to be a bit of a surprise when the Barbarian hits him with a Counter Spell. It's not going to be super reliable. I don't have a great intelligence score, but I can definitely counterspell anything of third level or lower, and I've got a shot at counterspelling higher level spells. Technically counterspell also powers our power surge feature. Again, not really a big incentive to use it that way. One spell I definitely like here though is Blink. I think Blink is great on this character. 
Blink isn't just going to protect us from attacks. So if you get hit with, you know, a Dragon Breath, for example, that can do a ton of damage, and our Rage doesn't protect us from that. Even if we make our Dexterity Saving Throw, we could still take a lot of damage, because those Dragon Breaths just do so much. But Blink actually gives us a 50-50 chance of not taking that damage at all. That's really nice. And again, it doesn't use concentration. We can set it up and then we can do our rage and it's not going to impact the blink. Now just two fourth level selections for us. The first one will be Arcane Eye. Again, this is something I'm going to be doing outside of combat. So it doesn't matter that it uses concentration. But the in combat spell I want is Fire Shield. Fire Shield has a 10 minute duration and doesn't use concentration. So this is very easy for us to set up before combat. It's not like those one minute spells where you really have to know that the combat is coming right up. If you are wandering through the dungeon or whatever, you know that you're going to be fighting something within the next 10 minutes and then you can use your Fire Shield. Fire Shield is going to give us resistance to either fire or frost damage. Both of them are common types of damage. But in addition, whenever a creature hits us with a melee attack, they're going to take some damage, 2d8 worth of fire or cold. And so we're doing a little bit of punishment for anyone who hits us, technically improving our offense and our defense, and with a decent duration. Fire Shield, I think, is a very good way to layer defenses. And that's 20 levels. Barbarian 9, Fighter 4, Wizard 7 is where we end up. 160 hit points is a good number of hit points for 20th level. We're going to have a plus 8 constitution save, a plus 6 wisdom save, a plus 2 dexterity save, usually with advantage, and we can apply a plus 4 to any of them. We also have lucky to get a reroll on any of them if we fail. So if we look at something like an ancient red dragon, which is a more powerful creature, kind of creature we might expect to face when we reach high level, we look at Frightful Presence, and that is a DC 21 Wisdom saving throw, or you're frightened for one minute. And if you fail that saving throw, you can repeat it each round. Thing is, is that your standard Barbarian may have 0% chance of making that save. So they're just frightened for a minute. And isn't that terrible if you're playing a Barbarian? This character has a very good chance of making that save. But if they are unlucky and they fail that save on round one, they have a very good chance of making it the following round. Then we have something like Fire Breath. Fire Breath has a 24 dexterity saving throw. Most Barbarians will have no chance of making that saving throw at all. We will actually have a chance to make that saving throw because we have Arcane Deflection. Now, we still probably won't make that saving throw. But I have things like Fire Shield that could reduce the damage or potentially absorb elements if I haven't started my rage yet. So I do have defenses that could potentially half that damage. And if we're looking at 91 damage, you half that, that's 45. I've got 160 hit points. I'm still well over 100 hit points, even after taking an Ancient Red Dragon's Fire Breath. And once we've moved past the Fire Breath and the Frightful Presence, this creature's going to have a lot of trouble against us. Because although it's going to be able to hit us fairly easy with attacks, once we have those damages, which we will be, it's just not adding up to a lot each round. 10 from the bite, 8 from each of its claws, that's 26 points of damage a round. We can take that for several rounds. Even with the legendary actions added in, that additional tail attack is only adding about 9 points of damage. So we can take everything this red dragon can dish out for several rounds. So if we mark it, then we're going to protect the rest of our party, but yet that dragon's still going to have difficulty even though it can easily get to us because of its high flight speed. So even against really tough creatures, this character is going to be able to function pretty effectively. So that is the Guardian. This is the tank build I'm presenting that I think takes care of its own defenses and takes care of the defenses of the rest of the party. I think this character is pretty effective at all levels. At all levels, it's delivering at least decent damage. And as it moves up in levels, the defenses just get better and better and better. So thanks everyone, and for now, I'm just going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks everyone, and I will talk to you next week.